You're tuned in to the MTGG Cable Cast, 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 where they cover magic, the gathering finance. All right? You don't know about it? You're tuned in right now and get ready to learn some shit. Buckle your seat belts and light a blunt and get ready for the MTG Cable Cast, 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 starring Reptar and Thirsty, them onion head motherfuckers. Alrighty, guys. Welcome to the newest episode of the Cabal Cast. This week, yes, we have something kind of interesting. So yes. the organized play announcement happened. Nobody really cared when the announcement was made. People started to care a little bit. They said, hey, we've got another thing. Well, guess what? Yeah. We had the equivalent of the Pro Tour, and now everything's changed. Mm -hmm. I don't know why the presence of the Pro Tour changed, but things have changed. Yes. So we're basically touching up with what were we kind of focusing on before the Pro Tour? And what are we kind of focusing on now that organized play is actually like here and relevant? How has that impacted business plans, the overall economy, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So with that, let's take it away. Bring it on. All right. So the, the OP announcement was made and nobody knew anything that was going on because there wasn't a clear uh, vision towards where things were going to go after regionals and the first pro tour. And we still don't really have that roadmap. All that we knew was that Magic Con or Magic Fest Philly, whichever it was, was re renamed. It lost that little bit of fanfare. Then we found yeah. out it was going to be a Pro Tour and what was going on there. And there was a lot of trepidation coming in into that event. But between the OP announcement and Philly, basically, for me personally, I just kept trucking along with what I was doing. I had basically swapped over to Commander Finance. Right now... And I don't see this part changing. Every set is a commander set, and it also comes with a commander set. So it's a ton of work. It became a lot more work to focus on than when it was a lot of constructed. Yeah. And I think for the past six months, I've probably been intaking more content than I thought I would looking for insights and edges into commander trends. I retooled a lot of my days to focus on check-ins and content, or content yep. creation to see who was doing what and what prices were moving, CK reprices twice a day, etc. And I did honestly abandon most of the constructed content creators mm -hmm. that I was following outside of set reviews. I used mm -hmm. I follow them because it's I still want to play the game myself as a constructed player, so I, I still followed along with that and that kind of shaped how i've been doing things for the past year plus honing in and toning things in from the op announcement forward to where i kind of have like my week scheduled and by the time friday rolls around i'm basically done with uh, all my podcasts i've caught up on my content creation from a vendor perspective i basically am just letting my buy list kind of run things i'm still cracking standard sets but i'm leaning my allocation requests very heavily towards exactly what people are looking for based on the information I have. If I'm the kind of vendor that sells a lot more CBs than draft or set, then I'm definitely going to change my allocation for that. And I would have done that immediately because if people aren't really playing standard that much, there might not be a lot more box cracking that people are looking to do. So they're not going to be buying a lot of the leftover sealed that I set aside for those people outside of CBs. So I might tone down the draft boxes that I buy in favor of set, which has the list. If the list looks good, then yeah, I might uh, up my allocation for wave two or wave three of a set if that's a driver. One of the adages that people have glommed onto for the past couple of years is cracking for standard stuff is kind of crap. Just buy the singles instead. We're seeing that with the price point of the new Commander Legends set. It's like... $360 for a set booster box, I think, or something like that. The prices came out yesterday or today. They kind of leaked out a distro. Yeah. And uh, off Amazon. <clears throat> and that's going to hold true the entire time. So I'll have changed my business model as a vendor because I need to be agile. I can't just stick with what I've been doing forever. It has to update. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't really going to events either. <clears throat> I'm not going to be traveling around to a lot of star cities that are, that are out of area. I don't need to press the flesh like that. I have my website, I have my buy list, I have my cards there. That's gonna change. That was before OP. I was waiting, I was holding my breath to see 
what is going to what is OP going to, to bring? And we have this flashpoint now with PT Philly, and everything that I did personally changes. And as a vendor, now everything that I'm going to do from here on out changes. So how about you? What were you doing? So it, you know, prior to the announcement, it had kind of been you know we were post COVID kind of recovering. EDH was still everything. Yeah. Right? There there wasn't any particular question like it was just EDH. If you were doing anything, guess what? It was EDH. Uh, and that was largely what I'd been focusing on. Uh, that's what the store had been focusing on, not with events or anything, <gasps> but at least with what we were taking as far as singles. Yeah, Any of yeah. that stuff was just, hey, let's uh, focus on that. We'll keep in, you know, the staples that are staples outside of EDH. For so your like, bread and butter formats, right? Yeah, your bread and butter formats. Like, obviously, if it overlaps, okay, we'll keep more wooded foothills. Yeah. We'll yeah. keep that stuff. Besides uh, and, and Odawaras are played in Commander as well as Modern. You have a modern player base, blah, blah, blah. blah. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. This is the stuff that pretty much, you know, most everyone had been doing. Yep. But the thing that's kind of changed now in a post OPA world, because when the announcement was made, uh, we said, hey, um, let's start to try to pick more of this stuff up, I guess, just because that's what we should try to do. All right, sure. We'll try to pick more of it up. We'll start throwing more events. We'll do, you know, whatever we can. Uh, well, you know, the problem was that none of those events mattered. They didn't fight. Yeah. They, they, they just didn't exist. Because if they're not a format your players like, they better be RCQs, basically. Yep. Okay. And so our weeklies didn't fire, which we were sure they would. Mm -hmm. uh, just didn't happen. Well, now that the Pro Tour happened, all of a sudden, everybody's coming in for Pioneer cards. Pioneer's firing. People are showing up. Not just at our store, but at other stores as well. So now we've kind of shifted. Obviously, your bread and butter is, you know, what it is. But... We were like, hey, let's ignore this stuff. We don't yeah. want to have anything to do with Pioneer Modern. We want to focus on EDH, Commander, whatever. And the really interesting thing was sealed product. Okay. Prior to the Pro Tour and everything that changed with it, it was the Walmart model. Get it all the fuck out of the door. Yeah. At your 10 to 15%, whatever we're making a margin on, just blow it out because in-store sales on that stuff never recovered when people came back to the store because the people that were going to buy a box from their LGS bought a box from their LGS even during COVID. It didn't yeah. matter. They'd still go buy it. We're not getting you know more new people in. I, I will say this. Wizard spouts all the time. Hey, uh, we're getting more new players. We're getting more new players. Where? We're not getting more new players. Mm -hmm. We don't have new players registering for events. We don't have anyone other than our usual people showing up, but they're there. It didn't reflect to sales. So it was get rid of it all as quick as you can. Okay. Uh, and that was one thing that definitely uh, has changed, which we can get to in a moment here. How did things change for on the other side? So after the after OP. Yeah. So after OP, it was really tentative. I made a couple of picks uh, for on the podcast for constructed cards, namely Groff's Messenger. That was a big one because we expected Modern to be in the upcoming year, and we still yeah. do. Yeah. Uh, but it was uh, there was a bit of trepidation. I started personally picking up more constructed cards in larger quantity to speculate on. Um, I bought a brick of foil coughs because I still believe that card is good in yep. formats you can play it in, constructed or not. I don't think it's like modern playable, but like an additional Valakut emblem seems decent, especially in Commander. Yeah. Some, you know, stuff like that. Bunch of Kembas because there was talk about it going in at Hammer, which is still a really good deck in modern. So again, looking forward to that. And so I've just kind of been nibbling away at what I... I used to do like reading through the spoiler like we do for the podcast kind of taking notes on what I think watching cards uh the the, the hawking the price basically especially because uh one was such a new uh like shift in how set releases are done with the timing of mm -hmm. street dates you know stores can now sell everything 
So I wasn't really sure where the bottom out was going to be. So that yeah, sure. added another wrinkle um, after OP announcements and now. And just kind of slowly towing back into buying into Constructed, personally. The flashpoint of the PT really does reinforce the fact that now I can go back to looking at Constructed a lot more heavily as an individual and as a vendor that wasn't there, seeing some of the photos that I did see where vendors were buying staples like Fable and the Mirror Breaker at 110 to 125% TCG market. And then coming out of that, those prices holding, make, that makes me really excited to know that people are going to come back in so I can ratchet my buy list as mm-hmm. a vendor. I can slant towards Constructed a bit more now. I can s- step away from Commander similarly. I'm doing the same thing personally. I'm stepping back from a lot of the content creation that I was consuming that I don't have to. I am going back to constructed only players that are higher end. And I'm basically retooling my day to ingest those VODs rather than commander content from Mm -hmm. around the web. And it's, I don't want to say like, ah, thanks, praise be the pro (laughs) tour. But it's nice to ha- to be able to reconstruct my day like the my day like this because Commander Finance seems to be like the twenty four hour news cycle, whereas Constructed yep. Finance there's always a bit of a lag, and a lot of that has to do with how deck lists make it out of Moto or are pulled from Melee to Arena uh, from Arena etc. and posted online. And you have a couple days to kind of like really think about what you're seeing and make your decisions based on that. You yeah. don't just have to be reactionary like you see a lot of the times. And a good example of this is like, so everybody's going nuts over Venerated Rot Priest. We talked about that card a couple of times. Everybody's going crazy for Elspeth and Atraxa kind of flies under the radar. Then the moment Atraxa hits Moto, it's in reanimator lists in Legacy. It's all over one of those, uh, like one of the first challenges. It takes like yeah. five of the top 16. Um, Aspiring Spike is doing a, a ton of iteration on it. And people just kind of flash into that because they treat it like the commander 24 hour news cycle. But at the end of the day, it's constructed. That's not how yeah. this operates. Formats take t- constructed formats take time to change and the older they are the longer they're going to take to change so you Mm -hmm. get to relax a little bit more you get to take in a lot of that content if you're not kind of like day trading away like i'm not as a vendor i don't have to be that reactive i don't have to flash a traxa on my buy list to pull in 50 to 100 in the next week or two not everybody that's coming to my website is going to be buying a traxa i can just let it attrition naturally and ratchet my buy list over time as more people buy in appropriately i'm also going to be cracking more as a vendor now because i know people are going to be coming in for constructed singles now that i see those prices hold like i mentioned it basically just allows me to shift back and i don't want to say this sounding like a a curmudgeon or like a fuddy-duddy but back to again what i know and like my tried and true models things that are a little slower and a lot easier to work with instead of having to constantly update and iterate what's going on i get to actually investigate take time and be like at the head. I don't have to be reactionary Mm -hmm. to what's going on. I can actually see what's coming, make my adjustments and be ahead of things by a little bit more than I was before. That's really what's changed for me, both as an individual and uh, as a vendor on that side of things. Mm -hmm. I think it's been really interesting to see kind of like how it how it's kind of gone back to i don't really want to say the glory days but almost like the glory days of magic finance where it was hey look we're you know we have a healthy ecosystem where there's multiple people existing working whatever and it's just very nice to see that happen again because i mean i you know i don't think i'm saying anything either of us don't know like that was kind of a, a deal like, for a yeah. while, we didn't think we'd ever have that again, mm-hmm. where we would have a vendor ecosystem, an LGS ecosystem. And do get me wrong. I'm not saying it's better, because let's be real. Uh, this is shit for the LGS. It is great for vendors, but we are still getting screwed as much as we possibly can. Oh, yeah. At, like, we're not at even, the LGS level. Yeah, we're not even bookending OP as a vendor in an LGS. Like, as a vendor, I, sur- I encompass OP... And we're just curb stomping the LG, the LGS. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like it does doesn't feel good. Yeah, you get one RCQ. Good luck. Right. Thanks. I guess. 
Uh, and especially now, the way they're being scheduled, it's some company coming in and saying, pick one of these two dates without knowing who, who has what dates in your area. Is like, it, thanks. Are you, like, talking about the DreamHack org? Because Reed Pop's yeah. the one putting on. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, the nice thing that's changed since is, you know, as I touched on earlier, we've kind of had this, like, in-store surge on Pioneer. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've said before on here multiple times that one of the things that St. Louis has always had is St. Louis has really been a, like, modern city. You can have three city, three, four stores at once doing modern on the same night, and you'll get 20 people at each. Mm -hmm. That's not the case anymore. It's actually Pioneer that's firing like that now, which is strange because it didn't for ever i i get that too like i really do with until we get that modern pro tour people just have to sit on their hands in anticipation and if they want to play a non-rotating format then they have to move into pioneer it is i do get that like yeah i don't think any store by me is firing modern anymore and i want i don't want to play pioneer but i want to play constructed magic so yeah that isn't standard so I kind of have to move in to Pioneer to scratch that itch. Yep. I get it. I get it. And that's, hey, guess what? We're going to have to live with that. Yeah. And that's fine. You know? Uh, but it's it's been interesting to see that. And we've actually had now, not just in terms of, like, sales and liquidity, have mm -hmm. some of that stuff go up, but also community involvement. There's actually people coming in that are like, hey, uh, my group can only do this night. What do you think? Or my group can oh, only yeah. do this. What do, what do you say? And it's been, again... Super interesting to see all of that because you are getting people who, hey, uh, I may not necessarily be involved as much. Uh, I may not care about the community before. Well, guess what? Now they do. Yeah. And they're trying to reach out and try to get this stuff going again, which I think is amazing. Uh, just absolutely incredible as an LGS to see people kind of take on this like, you know what? I do want to be involved. I am going to take up on this. We are going to do this. And that's just been really cool to see. So, so like self and community organizing. Right? Yeah, 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 which hasn't happened for a long time. And it's also nice for you because you get to fill up your play space yep. on more nights than just what it was exactly. previously. Even yeah. if you run events side by side, if you can still fire events, why not butts in seats? It's people there. Exactly. I think for me, what's going to be curious to see what happens at the LGS level is we did see limited at the pro tour and we didn't, but we didn't see a limited at DreamHack, which is fine because that's like the grand prix to pro tour kind of uh, setup. If you want to think about it that way. And the yeah. grand prix was only limited when the entire format was limited. But what does this do for limited at the LGS level? And if you continue to, if you haven't already or you have been change the way you set your purchases so will you slant away from draft boxes if people continue to play constructed because set boxes are better for pricing technically yeah. as well as busting kind of stuff like so we've actually kind of shift we've already been shifting away from draft boosters because drafts did happen at the pro tour they're doing it on arena yep Unless it's a set like Dom Remastered or something where they just can't, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah uh, but but by and large, standard drafts like we now granted, we still get one to two pods. Yep. But what we've basically been doing is we've been scaling back the amount of draft boosters we order and listing fewer of them online. But we have more here like for our drafters it's the same amount yeah. they can still be taken care of yep but the focus in terms of like sales and e-commerce and in store Prizes. we've gotten away from draft and moved to set and collector yeah and this like this hasn't changed that no we, we have people that have come in and said hey you know i i want to draft or whatever when do you guys do draft all right well we're still having the same amount of people show up every friday for drafts so i, I was assume i assume that's a puzzle you started to piece together the moment they said you're getting set boosters and draft boosters, and also in the set boosters, there's this thing called the list. You know, that was a problem for yep. years ago, uh, LGS to solve, right? Um, but if people, my question was more about whether or not people decide to keep sure. coming into the LGS to draft overall, and that, that the, that's a good point that you made. 
And the storylines they had at the arena, at the arena, at the pro tour that I actually liked, there was uh, two of them. One, the finalist that was playing Slesnia Auras, I cannot remember them, qualified awesome. for this pro tour via arena on their phone. And they really wanted to push that narrative as this, the, as this, this application is even ready for desktop release. <laughs> and like, that was fantastic to remind people that you can play this on your phone. Yeah. And the other is, I think the player in the like off the wall pod from day one with LSV, like the first pro tour player that three owed that pod. And then like four owed pioneer. Yeah. That I think they played mono white the storyline they told i think was them was to prep for draft after they qualified it was them and their friends and they just drafted at the lgs yeah so it was like these two really interesting storylines like this person qualified via a uh, a sealed event on arena on their phone and this other person just learned to draft at their lgs with their friends and it, like that was an interesting dichotomy and it's not like at the pro tour they were trying to push a narrative for digital they still gave you the opportunity the opportunity to remind you that like hey drafted your lgs and so like if they didn't do that then i then i could imagine a point uh, this is also an inflection point for draft with the lgs where people who are watching the pro tour went oh you draft on arena because they said you draft on arena the pro tour but they didn't so yeah. i'm kind of curious if, if that helps float like you're talking about where the number of people are saying the same you're just changing your allocation because you're no longer basically prizing out of draft packs or yeah. maybe this pushes more because that was the the narrative that came out of out of the pro tour um which doesn't change a lot for you it just means like ordering more boxes in a way yeah you know? exactly it's it's ordering more it's you know the the thing that i've realized and i think a lot of shops have since everything kind of you know happened yeah uh with arena and this incredible shift to basically you know get away from the lgs um like it it feels like this didn't really change anything. It was kind of them trying to say, hey, look, you can go to the LGS, but it hasn't, like, yeah. that doesn't influence players enough. Because let's be real, people are lazy. Yeah. Why would I go draft at my LGS when I can just do it in my underwear on my computer? Yeah. It's just way better. I also don't really play limited on Arena, and I just found out tonight, uh, or maybe it was yesterday. La yeah, yesterday. Um, my wife's been playing a lot of draft and she got frustrated with best of ones because you don't get the sideboard. So a lot of the cards that you would take for utility in your games, cards like plummet that can be traditionally good disenchant, etc., live in your sideboard yeah. in a lot of these sets, but in best of one, you have to main deck them. So sometimes they're dead. Sometimes they are S tier, right? Yeah. Um, but best of one is actually how you move up to mythic, not best of three. So even if you were to draft on arena, that's still not actually realistic when it comes yep. to comparison against OP. Like, so, to that end, too, drafting in person at the L just absolutely, absolutely makes sense, but that isn't like a bullet point or a footnote they add anywhere. It's just like, you play Draft on Arena, get to Mythic and make it a sub event. Uh, right, That's yeah. Ridiculous. Like, cool, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, I guess there will be, there might be another inflection point for the LGS once the OP announcement that I expect comes in the next couple of months to actually clarify things comes through and they give people more of a reason to go play at the LGS besides the one RCQ. We don't have yep. a point system yet, which is traditionally what brought people into the LGS because you could accrue, uh, when you had ELO, uh, like chess players, oh. you could grind to the pro tour that way. Uh, then planeswalker points. So you could also grind, uh, to the pro tour, mm -hmm. uh, via that method. And now it's just kind of muddy. I think Moxes on Moto can give you Pro Tour invites now. Yep. You have regionals that get you there. You have arena events that can queue you in. And it just seems very scattershot right now. And once that kind of coalesces and there's clarification given, more of a roadmap for the player, that's when the LGS gets to see their bump, hopefully, yep. because you get more events to run that are more meaningful to players than just the one RCQ. But it is nice when you can say, okay, the RCQ is Pioneer, right? The next one is, we know that, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Regionals is Pioneer, so your RCQs have got to be either Limited or Pioneer. So you just fire Pioneer because Limited isn't Regionals, right? And now your players who want to queue for RCQs, like we we have talked about this in the podcast prior. You yeah. Can, your weeklies or your Mondays or whatever can now be Pioneer and you can kind of like 
bait hey guys, the trap. grind it out here. Yeah. yeah, bait the trap. Come come practice Pioneer here yep. kind of thing. You know, you pick your knight that isn't going to rub up against another LGS's Pioneer knight, and then everybody gets to set their hook as they need and reel in their players. And then yeah. that brings them in and, you know, changes things for you. So, you know, it's nice to see that things are looking up, but not where they need to be quite yet. Yeah. But it this isn't quite the uh, the the boot to the throat for the LGS that we thought it could have been. In all honesty, if there wasn't a PT to push OP, yeah, then yeah, we could have seen continual trending against the LGS like we have. And it, it was interesting, you know, like here's a secret layer we're given to the LGSs. Here's oh, yeah, all these I heard about that. Like, it, man, he did that before. Nobody cares. Like. It, you got to do something. And the, the thought was, and this is something you and I have talked about, is when you give people that organized play ladder to climb, and it's clear, and they know how to do it, yep. it actually promotes the LGS ecosystem. And that's the thing that a lot of shop owners are like excited about now that I know is like, hey, if they're doing this, and this is actually like a thing that's happening, we're in a pretty good spot. Yeah. FTVs didn't bring people to the LGS. Especially the rank ones. Yep. I was thinking about Annihilation, but that one was that one turned to be okay. Um, what's the Realms? I think yeah, Realms, Realms is like yep. the worst one still because yep. they printed Grove. Um, they reprinted Grove. Like that doesn't bring players into the LGS. That that that's for people who want product with the worst foiling known to man, or speculators to yeah. pick up and hold. Um, it. it didn't generate new DCI numbers, you know? Yeah, like... E yeah, exactly. That That's the face that should be put on the net. That's that LGS-only secret layer. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's nice to see that they're trying, which is more than they've done in a very long time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's, that's kind of where, again, a lot of the people I know are at is, hey, uh... You're trying. You'll you'll get points for that for once. Yep. But it is looking better. Yeah. Whether again by design or accident. Yeah. This is the last there. thing I'm gonna say before uh, I'm ready to head into picks. But sure. Uh, I knew nature was healing when on day two of the pro tour I decided to buy my Skrells and I was already paying like a 25 percent premium because I didn't order them on day one. Yep. I, I knew nature was healing when I had to pay more Yeah, <laughs> for a card on day two of the that Pro is, Tour. You know, hey, uh, the Pro Tour uh, finds a way. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. I, I, held, I held on for long enough on that card. I was like, I don't know if it's going to be good enough. It only has Toxic 1. You can't suit it up that well. And then it just kind of ran a rough shot. I was like, all right, fine, yep. fine, fine. I need my floor. I'll do it. Right. But I, I was happy to lose out on that. Um, I... I Life finds a way. All right. You yep. ready for picks? Let's do it. All right. I can't remember who went first last time, but I'm going to go first because I just have a big, dumb black creature to talk about. Hell yeah. Let's do it. All right. So uh, for me this week, I am looking at Rune Scarred Demon from uh, Corset 2012 fame and uh, IMA. 5-5 five, five Flying Demonic Tutor. Close. 6-6. Six, six. Or 6-6, six, six, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is a card that's seen some up and downs when we look at the entirety of the stocks graph. <clears throat> but uh, really what we're looking at here is this kind of downtrend heading into um, Aquaria. We'll get there in a moment to talk about why. But yep, up front, this costs five double black for a 6-6 six, six flyer. That has an ETB of Demonic Tutor or Diabolic Tutor, wh whichever you want to consider. You just search your deck for a card, put it in your hand, call it a day. And this has been a card I've been sitting on since I think... Yep, uh, July of 2022. CK was buying 30 at $3.25, and TCG Market uh, was $4.87, and there were 164 copies. Now, I did drag my feet on this a bit, so the market price is up higher than I want it to be, but it's because I was hoping Bialis would increase a little bit more than we've seen, and CK has been dragging their feet on this well, worse than I, ha I have. They are buying 21 copies, at three dollars eighty, so that's up fifty-five cents, but down in terms of overall quantity. And they're only buying two set foils for four dollars forty. So people just are not buying this card from Card Kingdom. They're sourcing this elsewhere. 
There are currently 109 listings left on TCG Player, LP or better, for $6.45 market. So we definitely did miss a lot of profit on this, but I don't think we need to worry that much. Yeah. So up top, you know, why would you play this in Commander? Well, because you're playing black and you need another Demonic Tutor. That's it. You can play this in the early game, the mid game, or the late game because you don't have to pay seven for this card. You could pay two, one to entomb yep. it and another to reanimate it. That's it. <laughs> like so, this plays all up and down the curve at all points of the game. Overall, in the format, uh, again, five and double black for a six-six flyer with demonic tutor upside, and this is well above rate because after you subtract demonic tutor from the mana value, you're only paying four and a black for a six-six yep. flyer, like which is fantastic. Now, of note. I mentioned this is an ETB trigger, and that does make it a little bit vulnerable over, say, a cast trigger, but the upside is that reanimation effects, like I mentioned, do give you a second avenue to re-trigger this. Also, yep. cheating it into play via, via reanimation or Piper effects also means you can play from ahead. And I realized while I was writing this, I don't think we've ever defined what a Piper effect is, and they don't really happen much anymore. Um, and I find that kind of interesting that I have to define this. Uh, a Piper effect is short for Elvish Piper. Elvish Piper yep. is like three and a green for a 1-1 one, one that has a tap, uh, an activated ability of green and tap, put target creature card from your hand onto the battlefield from Urza's <laughs> Destiny, I think. It's the Flask. I think that was the original printing. So Aether Vial is basically a Piper effect uh, yes. where you just tap something and put a creature into play, right? So show and tell, sneak attack kind of stuff too as, as well works for this because it's an ETB over a cast, right? So again, you get to play ahead from ahead with this. You get to re-trigger it all gravy. Now, this is in Magic 2012, and if you've been paying attention to Commander, the big kerfluffle right now is about pre-DH, and 2012 is like just outside pre-EDH, right? We're not just talking 10 years ago because of the way core sets worked. Yeah. It survived evolution of the format from 2011 to now and maintains prominence in a niche that WotC has seemingly not wanted to upgrade with something more impactful yep. or powerful. That's why this is a $6 rare, because Wasi just hasn't done anything with this space. Early, mid, late game, this card plays well and provides incredible utility, because it's just Demonic Tutor with upside, which is yep. really weird to say. And it's incredibly innocuous and doesn't draw much ire, and that's really nice. But that basically means this is assuredly a more casual commander card, and now that the vintage play that it did see in Oath decks has basically dropped down to zero, that's really all we're looking at. We're not looking at more competitive commander cards because they're probably not going to be reanimating this. They're going to be reanimating something a little more impactful to the game that wins on the spot or the turn thereafter. So this isn't like a huge breadth of the player base, just casuals. And so this puts the onus squarely on your local casual pods, your kitchen table crowd, and people that enjoy demons. Really good in Cali of the Vast, ETB trigger, right? Timeline-wise, when we look at the graph, we see a lot of sawtoothing. So I'll bring that back up now. And you, from the recovery point on after Ikoria to now, this is basically just a sawtooth, sawtooth graph with a nice average running through it. Yeah. And it's been on the rise without stop since its reprint in Mystery Booster 1 in March of 2020. That's the drop that I talked about before. After that hits, it tanks. And then just from there, it's been on an upward trajectory and if that continues in three months we should see an increase of a few dollars allowing us to flip into the open market for decent profit again bias movement has been rather slow the entire time lagging well behind market movement and i wouldn't expect that to change i don't think people are buying us from card kingdom truthfully yep. i do believe the best exit for this card is from your binder two players at local events as these have grown scarce and serving your locals immediately will yield profits though smaller yep. than waiting a few months looking at sales velo though i expect supply to drop in three to four months if things stay steady and if you wanted to maximize profit that's where i would be on this locals are great because seeing it in the binder brings eyes to it immediately you can serve your locals you can move this into something else that might sell for more later or something you need you know chase it around what have you pure profit though absolutely flip back on a tcg player yeah reprint equity is really hard on this because i don't understand why this hasn't been reprinted in a standard set since 2012 i could have sworn this is actually in magic 2013 as well but right. it wasn't 
However, at this point, I wouldn't expect it to make a return anywhere outside a commander deck. We've been to a couple planes that had a very high demon focus. Never got a reprint in those in those sets. We saw Kalia of the Vast and some of the other pieces of that deck get reprinted in various supplementals. This wasn't alongside that. I don't understand why Watsi has not chosen to reprint this card more proactively. But because of that, we now get to be a little bit reactive, pick this up, see ahead that we're not getting a commander deck in this next set that's going to really work with this. Maybe we get something with the Lord of the Rings stuff. That one is just an absolute wild card for a number of the picks we've talked about over the last year. And maybe that stymies the price for a little bit. But I don't expect that to actually make a dent. This would have to be printed in a standard set for it to really shut down the price trajectory yeah. of this card. As we've seen, it re does rebound rather well. So that one was difficult to kind of crystal ball. By quantity, uh, since I've been playing Commander since pre-DH pre or whatever, I've got about a dozen of these strewn across all my decks because I play it in every deck with black, and that's where I'm happy. Yeah. That would That's about you know, $78, $80 worth of Runescar Demons, including a couple foils. And that's basically what I would recommend. If, you're, if you do really want to serve your locals, going too deep on this card means you're going to have to flip this into the open market to actually begin making profit. So I would kind of take a step back, evaluate your locals, kind of source out how many mid to late game black decks there are, and then buy accordingly. If you're fine sitting on some new move into the open market later on, then yeah, you could go well above a dozen if you'd like and just pick up as many as you think is necessary or pick up as many as you want to play because again, this does play at all avenues of the game. This is one of my favorite EDH cards because it is so, like... I, I don't really want to say unheralded, but I know a lot of people that have, you know, come into EDH and this being from the pre-EDH, yeah. you know, era. They just don't know it exists. But it's really good. Uh, Demonic mm -hmm. Tutor is fine. Stapling something you can reanimate onto it stapling something you can pod or eldritch evolution or neoform or yep. whatever onto it it just makes it a more modular version of demonic tutor yeah. and you know what's great tutors yeah absolutely more modular tutors there's a lot of th reasons that this card is very good yeah. i also think it's one of those cards that has that very strange almost like I don't know if contagious is the right way to put it but it's one of those things where I've seen people play it in play groups and the next time that play group gets together everybody has that card oh yeah I see what you're saying yeah yeah everybody has it in their deck it's the kind of thing that one or two guys see and then all of a sudden or gals hey great we're doing it let's go and I think that's really cool. Yeah, it, it's like somebody basically uncovered some hidden tech in the format that's actually really good. And yeah, then, yeah, other is. people glom onto it because they're like, holy crap, I didn't know you could be doing something like this. Right? Yeah. Just like, oh, you, cool, I'm going to do that too. Yeah, exactly. It, um, I'm, I'm sure we've talked about Haunted Crossroads a bunch. That's an, another little piece of hidden tech. Somebody sees Volrath Stronghold yep. and then, like, Scry falls the majority of that text and they find out there's yeah. something. There's another version of that card out there. Yeah. I didn't think about that, but you're absolutely right because this has been gone, quote unquote, gone from the format for so long. It's lost high visibility that, yeah, when that one person shows up and it's just like our, the game's entered the mid to late phase, everybody's on fumes, and then somebody top decks Rune Scar Demon. Right. Yep, you have Rune Scar Demon. Then you tutor up your Slave of Bolas. Is that the the black version? The. Uh Yes, yeah, sack draw. Yeah, yeah. sack gain life yeah. draw cards, and you just so you tutor that up, and now you just have a grip while everybody else is out. Like you can do stuff like that. Yeah, the whip of Erebus this back for Pretty two good. bites at the apple. Yeah, exactly. And they're like, oh wow, that's value. Yeah, yeah, that's that's actually a really good reminder that people do pick up on tech like that, and it does begin to kind of seep into other players' decks. That's a very good look. Yeah, yeah, big big fan, big fan. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, my pick, uh, for those of you that have been following around with what's been going on over the announcements at Magic Philly, everything else, 
Of course, the thing that people are most in love with, that most care about, or most like, this is sick. Uh, Sliver EDH decks. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, that too. Uh, yeah. The, the product slate for Commander Legends was released, including the Commander decks. One of them happens to be Slivers. Yes. Yeah. So, everyone and their mother said, hey man, let's go for Sliver Queen. Like, fine. Whatever. Sure. Who cares? It's reserve list, and there's an excuse to do the thing. Yep. Yeah. Whatever. Say the thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that's ridiculous. Sliver Queen, whatever. Who cares? It's fine. It's not a card I want to be involved in right now sounds ludicrous because we're of this but in this case the card i am targeting is because of the sliver or the sliver edh deck yes. announcement virulent sliver the foils yes this card's great because not only does it play into slivers it plays into poison infect whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. because it has poisonous one and poisonous is toxic or is stackable so, if you swing with a bunch of slivers, or you clone a virulent sliver, they all have poisonous two, not poisonous one. But these foils, which are from a completely different era in terms of foil insertion ratio, uh, and foil quality, because mm -hmm. it's time spiral block, it's from Future Sight. Foils are sitting at like $8 right now. This card is not getting a Future Sight foil reprint nope. anytime soon. Uh, they seem to be making an effort to include infect type stuff poisonous whatever into the game mm -hmm. uh and this does all of that yes and it does it multiplicatively because sliver uh which is great at eight dollars i will say quantity wise i probably wouldn't be comfortable getting more than like four to five <laughs> but that's 32 dollars to get a card that we're going to park and sit on now if you notice there was a spike on this card before, shortly after Kaldheim. Yes. Uh, we spiked up to 40 ish, 40, 45, somewhere in there. Uh, cool. Great. Love that. I am perfectly okay with that. Uh, that said, I think we could get there again once that sliver deck hits. Now, the thing you can tell with any kind of financial manipulation that goes on in magic finance is you have the obvious ones sliver queen goes quick early easy anytime you see a reserve list buyout those penny stocks those slumlord stuff that grim feast all that garbage goes up later yeah we're not to the point where virulent is going to start to go up yet nope. but it will yes i am very confident especially with us ostensibly possibly acquiring more infect or poison or whatever support over the next few months as we get more and more cards from Phyrexia. I, I don't really know what to, the Avengers, the Marvel Cinematic Universe of Magic, whatever you want to call the next year of just Phyrexian bullshit. Mm -hmm. But while we get that, this card gets better and better. When we get more slivers, this card gets better, better and better. Yep. And God forbid we get a toxic sliver as well. Because being able to run two of these is insane. Yeah, yeah. And not a card named Toxic Sliver because we have that, but one with Toxic. Yeah. With Toxic, yes. Yeah. That has the Toxic keyword on it. That is incredible. Yes. Uh, and that is what I would expect to happen. Now, timeline-wise, again, when we get that Commander Legends Commander deck, that's when we're out of this card. Mm -hmm. We are getting rid of it at peak demand when that, card, when that deck hits and people start fooling around with it, wanting to mess with it. Granted, there is a chance we maybe get this card in there? I don't think so, though, because we have Toxic, not Poisonous. Mm -hmm. I think it's more likely that we will get some kind of replacement for it or something to take its place. And that's what we end up with. Yep. Uh, the, but... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, the, we keep talking about this. Like, it doesn't have a bunch of reprints. And I, I want to call this out before we move on. There yeah. are a bunch of small print reprints. The yeah. spike you mentioned around call time is Time Spiral Remastered. And what happens to Time Spiral Remastered? We get a reprint of this. Exact yep. same art. Not the Future Sight frame. That's yep. also really... So you mentioned up top, this is a Future Sight foil. It's not just from that era. This is Future Sighted. 
Yes. We don't actually know where this card lives yet, much like Tarmogoyf. And honestly, at this point, it may never live anywhere because poisonous is not a keyword we have. Toxic is. Correct. And Tarmogoyf's home is Master Sets. That could be much like this card. Yeah. The only other printing with this, with the Future Sight frame, is the list version of this card, which does not yeah. come in foil either. So uh, that's the point I wanted to raise is that yeah. of the reprints, every version that comes in foil has the old has the new frame. It does not have yeah. the future sighted frame. Future sight. So I think that is also really important to this card. Yeah. And it's it's something that at the price point it's at, sitting at about eight dollars, yeah. it's a very nice like all right, cool. Let's uh let's let's sit here with this and see where we go because worth mentioning there was another card in future sight snake cult initiation which had poisonous three on it oh boy that to me says this is not a card we're going to get reprinted probably ever at this point okay because it made sense for time spiral remastered because it was time spiral block that's where we got yeah, it the first time we got it the first time uh we do know though we haven't gotten anything in future sight border ever, ever outside of future sight really uh I, I just think it's a really solid look. I think it's yeah. a get ahead of it kind of thing. And I think that at four to five copies, you're looking at realistically spending maybe 40, 50 bucks on the high end if you have to go digging. Mm -hmm. uh, that to me seems fine. Yeah. I'd, I'd pick it up, I'd put it in a binder. Maybe, you know, if I get, say, five copies, I'll put one in the binder just to kind of get it out there and people thinking, oh, this will be really good when the sliver deck comes out. Yeah, it sure will. Yeah. Absolutely. And then they'll think back, wait, this guy has it. Yes. Yeah. The. One of the things I like most about this card is that while it might not be the highest played win condition according to Wreck in a Sliver deck, it does do something else inside the combat step that people have to worry about. You yes. look at Magma Sliver, you look at all the Slivers that give First Strike, and uh, the, all the ones that give Trample, and Toxic Sliver that gives Death Touch, and like those four are kind of your bread and butter. Magma Sliver just allows you to fireball, you tap one Sliver to fireball another Sliver. Yeah. It has First Strike, Trample, and Death Touch, so it just comes over for regular combat damage. But when all of your Slivers have Poisonous 1, that's another route to winning the game, which I really like. It just presents you with another option. I don't think there's a Sliver that mills the opponent when it hits, but at the yeah, end of the- I think it's just ETB. Yeah, but at the end of the day, this does allow you to find, I don't want to call it necessarily an alt win con because it's still winning through combat. It just yeah. opens up another way to win through combat, which is really important to the Sliver deck. You can't always rely on Legion or Code no. of Arms to get the or Magma Sliver to get the job done. You need to find another way to do it. There's, I think, Siphon Sliver that triggers when a Sliver attacks. You basically yep. drain and gain one for each mm -hmm. attacking sliver, cool, that's a way to do it. You can push that damage through. You can make uh, your slivers unblockable effectively by giving them shadow, so you can win through a poison kill, which, like we talked about in previous episodes, might not be that savory, but it's not your main plan, it's the backup plan. You know, you can definitely win through combat in a lot of scenarios, but this allows you to win alternatively in combat, and I think it's you don't really glean that when you look at wreck but when you see this card in a binder and you figure out exactly how poisonous one works it just becomes a little bit clearer like oh hey for a minimal investment i too can win the game in pretty short order or more effectively than waiting for one of those other slivers to show up because yep. slivers are about synergy at the end of the day and if all your synergy is uh plus one plus one first strike and haste you're not going to do that well no. in the game overall you're going to cast a bunch of little turds absolutely but it you're just not going to really do much yeah so I, that's one of the reasons why i like this as a look overall i also wait for the day that we can go back to playing this in constructed formats because like you said poison is one stacks and when you just dump four of these on the board bam that's it you know that Flash Hulk, baby. Yeah, exactly. We took I, I, we played the guessing game ahead of the podcast yeah. of what does Virulent Sliver do, and I went through everything until I got to the Bubble Hulk win or the Flash Hulk yeah. win. <laughs> like, <laughs> it it's it's really cool, and I think this is also a good opportunity for people to take a look at Sliver decks on Wreck and see 
what are some of these time spiral block slivers that are really unique? What are some of the onslaught block slivers that are really unique? What slivers from Tempest that aren't crystalline are really unique and within like striking distance of my wallet? And I think this is a really good one to head up and there are some others behind it. So you might not have thought about it, but I think this is a really good call out overall to say, hey, look at this and some of the other odds and ends. If it sounds familiar that we have a, a Slivers pre-con coming towards us, it's because there was a premium deck series, Slivers, that does have a lot of these cards in it. You can go take a look at that list and see what was in there and make some some calls based on that. There's uh, a lot of grist in the mill for yep. Slivers. And there's definitely a lot of avenues to make money off of Slivers. You just have to pick the most appropriate ones, and it's not that difficult to figure it out at the end of the day no oh, yeah so I, I i like this as a look now and i'm hoping we have at least one more sliver in our midst before we get to the uh the commander decks yeah so. i think we will i'm sure we can come up with one yeah absolutely anything else for this week no, i'm good all right so for at mtg cabalcast on twitter facebook patreon and youtube i am at halt i am reptile you are at thirsty sizzler we'll see you next week